of that came from writing several contracts and getting those contracts accepted. So uh, I'm here today to basically share my tips and tricks. Um, I also want to kind of get an idea of everybody's you know, length of time in real estate. So I've asked a few of you guys, but Jermaine, how long have you been licensed? Um, for 11 months. Okay, 11 months, so new, all right. So you're hitting the pavement, you're having fun, right? First, first year is fun. Danelle's the first year, yep, that's fun. Um, you get a lot of bumps and bruises and you learn a lot, right? Yeah? Okay, that's all right, it's all right. We're gonna help you with some of that. Bruises make you better. Yes. And then Robert, how long have you been in? Sorry, I asked you right when you took a bite. That's what I meant to do. <laughs> 19 years. 19 years, okay, wow, wow, okay, good. And you started with probably a Remax, Keller Williams. Let's see. Um, Century 21. Okay. And then Keller Williams. Okay. Uh, Keller Williams was a different beast back then than it is now. Okay. And, and then it was. I sold new homes for uh, about a dozen years. Okay. Yeah. So it did Melody. Yeah. Or, yes. Um, all right. Well, good. So we've got a nice range. Um, so my first few years in real estate were like, woohoo, this is awesome. Oh my gosh, what's going on? Oh, this is awesome. Oh my gosh, can I do this? You know, this is like this big roller coaster, right? And I feel like the biggest, biggest magic wand that I can tell everybody when you're trying to get your offers accepted is action. Like action. You have to actually write the offer. You have to gather information, right? If you don't act, how could you possibly get the offer accepted? And I know it sounds silly and it's very common sense, but I think a lot of um, agents will go, oh, it's just so hard to get anything accepted these days. Like there's multiple offers, you know. So the second thing that I would give you as, as the best advice is you've just got to keep a good attitude. And that is really hard, I think, in the industry because of the ups and the downs. And we're 100% commission. You know, today you wake up in the morning and you're at zero dollars, okay? Zero dollars is how much money I made this morning, yay! That's not exciting. You don't know that once you clock in, you get money. You know, you don't have that guarantee. So you are your own guarantee. You're the one that needs to have the good attitude. You're the one that needs to act. So the next part of getting your offers accepted, I would say, is you've got to start understanding the psychology of selling. Uh, who in here has ever read uh, or listened to audiobooks for Brian Tracy's Psychology of Selling? Mm -hmm. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite books. What's it called? Psychology of Selling. Brian Tracy, it's an audio, uh, Audible has it, but I probably listen to that once every two to three years. Like, it's one of my all-time favorites. And I feel like it helps anybody who's in sales start to understand, it's like a chess game in sales. And by the way, if you are in this room and you don't realize you're in sales, you are in sales. Um, we are all in sales and 100% commission. And it's like you just have to get that in, in your mind and you have to start understanding What's the buyer's perspective? What's the seller's perspective? So we're gonna start off with the psychology of it. Understanding a seller's point of view. Now I know we're writing offers, so we're writing offers to the other party, but you need to know your opponents. You need to know who you're dealing with. So you have to understand the seller's point of view. Now, when I started off, I had no listings. I just did contracts, 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 contracts. In one year, I had over 70 contracts accepted. A whole lot of writing contracts. And that's not even, that's accepted offers. That's not even how many I wrote. For some of my clients, we write 10, 15 contracts just to get one accepted. But it's going through all those motions, it's that experience that gets you better and better and better. And I'm gonna also advise you all, you have to fail. You have to fail in order to understand what did I do wrong, what could I have done better, and then you also have to see the success to be able to know what, you know, what did work and how you can incorporate it into each and every single offer that you do right. So that's what I have done over the years, is every single time I've written an offer, I learned from it. Ooh, that worked, oh my gosh, that was awesome. Okay, I'm gonna start using that on every one. But will they work for every single one? No. So it's like you gotta have this, I, I call it my bag of tricks. I've just got this bag of tricks for everything I do in real estate. Ooh, okay, here's somebody who uh, is desperate to sell. I know what to do. Here's somebody who 
just wants to make a lot of money and they think the market's hot. Okay, I know what to do. So it's having all those I know, I know, I know, I know. So let's understand the seller's point of view. And this isn't everything. And you guys can probably offer some, some ideas on a seller's point of view. But why does a seller usually sell their home? Usually it's financial. You know, most people are, how much can I sell it for? What am I going to net? Um, maybe it's a change in their job. Maybe it's a change in marital status. Could be a divorce. It could be because they're getting married. Could be because they're, um, mul you know, multiple families joining. So there's lots of things. So we kind of have to understand it's an emotional roller coaster for both sides. And then during the contract, you got to keep both sides sane and keep them in this nice little baseline, right? So downsizing, it could be upsizing, new job promotion, woohoo, I'm going out to buy my dream home. It could be like, oh my gosh, I can't afford this mortgage anymore, I need to downsize. Or it's too big, too much maintenance. Uh, forced sales, foreclosures, bankruptcies, pending foreclosures, um, to make money, inheritances. So what if somebody in your family leaves you their house and all their debt? You gotta sell it, you gotta get rid of it. What if they left you the house with all the equity, woohoo. Let's go, let's go make money. Um, school, work, religion, change in lifestyle, neighborhood. Um, you guys ever heard of WIIFM? What is in it for me? Every seller says that, and you have to think that. So when you're gonna go approach a seller, realize they don't care about your buyer, they don't care about you, they don't care about your offer, they're only going to care about what's in it for me. How much do I get? When does it close? Are they going to be easy to work with? Me, 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 me. So it's like you cut, you've got to get it in your head first. How to approach the seller and what they're thinking. Other things, so what interests seller? Highest net, simplicity of offer, appealing terms. Why would appealing terms be something a seller would be interested in? Because it's going to make them more money if it's the right terms. Less hassle, more money, uh, easier transaction, you know. What's in it for me? Reasonable terms, cooperative and fair buyer. Why would, why would a seller want a cooperative and fair buyer versus a high maintenance demanding buyer? It's going to make his transaction easier, right? Um, cash, so sellers generally, and I, I do a lot of listings now, more about on the listing side now, but I learned a whole lot from the buying side. And as a selling agent, I get to see sellers' reactions a lot more now. So oftentimes they're like, Oh, what kind of loan do they have? Are they cash? Like right away, are they cash? How high is the offer? Um, how much am I gonna net? It's like these are the first questions that come out of their mouth because again, it's just what's in it for me. So typically, let me try this pointer. Okay, so typically cash is the most important, right? Cash is king, everybody wants cash. Hi, thank you. Uh, then conventional, then FHA or VA. Now why, okay, I love the military. I have a big veteran family. So why don't sellers want to accept my VA offers? That's not nice. We we're proud supporters of the military. Well, guess what? Because it ends up being more of a hassle, more costly to them, uh, tougher appraisals. So experience or guidance has taught them that cash is simple, then conventional is next best, and then FHA or VA are gonna be bumpy and rocky because of either their own experience or what they have been told, okay? Just realize they're gonna think that way. So our more challenging offers, right, are gonna be FHA or VA, whether we want them to or not. So then our, we'll talk about strategies on getting those kinds of offers accepted. Um, ideal closing time, time frame for seller, again, just time frame in general. They wanna know when it's gonna close, if it's convenient for them, right? Now, now that you guys understand the seller's point of view, is there anything else that you can think of that sellers are thinking or, or that you've experienced? Why? Their point of view. I've covered a lot, but anybody? Good, yeah, yeah. So if, if you've worked with the agent, they may have known that agent. That agent might have sold their last house and they feel like they did a horrible job. Or that agent might have sold their house and they did a phenomenal job and they, they love it. They like seeing that name on, on the contract when it comes over. Yeah. Or they have a family member that is in real estate that they think they have to do. Yeah, yeah. So, so they might have this pressure of having to sell their home through a certain you know vehicle or person because of that pressure. Yeah. But yeah, so sellers have a lot going on. You know, they have a lot going on, but just realize 
what's in it for me is what matters. So you gotta speak with the seller when you're presenting the offer. Take it into consideration. Now, understanding a buyer's point of view. So buyers, you've got a lot of different kinds of buyers. You might have first time home buyers and they don't know what's going on. They don't know what an escrow is. They, most buyers don't know what an escrow is, by the way. Most sellers don't even know. Most sellers are like, what? Well, what do you mean sign? What's a recording? What's a, whose title? What does title do? It's so confusing. And, and the other thing you have to understand is the history of uh, transactions. You know, most buyers and sellers go through this process once every three to five years, right? So if they're not accustomed to all of these phases of the process, so we have to educate during all of this as well. So why does the buyer buy a home? Financial reasons, a lot of the same reasons, notice, okay? For sale, um, you know, foreclosure, bankruptcy, to make money, societal, family pressures, change in lifestyle, so notice. But again, notice what's in it for me. Buyers have the same mentality, right? How much of a deal can I get this house for? How low do you think we can get it for? Um, do you think the seller's gonna be willing to repair all these repairs? You know, they're kind of like, oh, I don't want a house built, I don't want a project. I don't want um, to feel like I got taken advantage of. I don't want to feel like, it, there's a lot of like this pressure of, of making sure they didn't buy too high or buy a house that kind of the money pit. Have you guys all seen the money pit? Okay, great movie, okay? Um, and again, they're gonna look at simplicity of the, uh, whoops, did we go backwards? There we go, sorry. Um, best terms for a buyer. They're gonna look at, obviously, lowest price, best deal, meets personal criteria. Their big thing is gonna be, does it work in my price range, my budget, right? So if you're pre-qualified for $300,000, then you need to stay within that $300,000. And anything that's gonna cost you more than that, you've gotta got be able to understand and educate your buyer on that. Um, so a lot of the beginning of getting your offer accepted, I feel like, is in the preparation. It's preparing your buyer. It's kinda of like, again, your toolbox. Pre-qualify, educate them, give them a net sheet. Same thing with the sellers, but yeah, you're, you're just preparing your action plan so when you go out, you're ready to fight, right? If you're if you're in the military, you're going to make sure that you know how to shoot a gun. You're gonna make sure you have a gun. You're gonna make sure that you have the right equipment. You're gonna make sure that you have uh, the right shelter. You're gonna make sure that all of these pieces are in place. Same thing if you're gonna be helping a buyer. You've gotta have all these tools ready to go. Um, Seller willing to reduce if appraisal comes in low. Now, that's a big one, and a lot of times, it, it's a really tough one. So, doing your market analysis, figuring out what the property is actually worth before you write, and then letting the buyer know about the consequences of what can happen are going to help kind of keep that deal together. So, a lot of times, I see uh, buyers, agents, who are writing really strong offers, but they're shooting themselves in the foot if it's too strong. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a, a property that's priced at, uh, say, 300000 but the highest comp is two eighty five, and you write an offer for three hundred five because it's multiple offers, what are you doing to your buyer? You're shooting them in the foot, unless they actually have all that extra fun cash that they want to overpay for a home. You don't want to do that. But there's other ways around it, and we're going to talk about it. So um, my, the funnest part of getting your offers accepted, in my opinion, is to do what other agents are not willing to do or they don't do. And that's all about being creative. The more creative that you can get, ethically, legally, but creative, the better. And I think that's why the majority of my offers do get accepted, is that I do put a lot of time and preparation into making sure that my client is going to get the offer they want accepted. Uh, deal closing time, time frame for buyer, bragging rights, okay? Don't you love it when buyers say, I got the best deal, and my realtor, Danelle, helped me find this home. We got our offer accepted. We beat out 20 offers. We got it accepted. Bragging rights. Buyers love bragging rights. Same thing with sellers. Sellers actually love uh, bragging rights too. I sold my house for 15000 you know, more than my neighbor. Same thing. But you, you see the psychology of both of them? Now, what do you notice about the psychology of the buyer and the seller? They both need to feel like they got the best. What's in it for me? Mm -hmm. They are opposing, okay? 
So that's where you come. You, you come in the middle and you've got to bring them closer together, as close as you possibly can, so they still feel like what's in it for me is worth it, right? It will never ever, I mean, it shouldn't teeter to one side or the other, it should be a nice compromise, but you just gotta keep open mind and keep this nice balance going. And if you can, if you can figure out the balance, you're going to get more of your offers accepted, for sure. Any questions so far? No? Okay, cool. All right, communication. So, uh, and we're gonna go through an actual contract. So I have a contract that I actually wrote, and I'm gonna show you some of the uh, actual terms or, or tips, clauses that I use. Um, a lot of it is fact-finding in the beginning. So about your buyer, then about the property, the area that they want to shop in. But once you have identified the actual property, I feel like a lot of it is going to be solid, clean offer from a pre-qualified buyer. Does anybody in this room write offers or take buyer shopping without a buyer broker agreement or without um, having them pre-qualified or proof of funds in hand? Be honest, I want some hands out because I know there's some people in here that have done it or do it. The buyer broker, yeah. Okay. By a broker, he's tough, okay? I've shared this um, story a few times in different trainings that I've done. Um, I lost a million dollar transaction because I did not get a buyer broker agreement signed. I shot pregnant with this buyer, okay? Full blown, like seven, eight months pregnant, middle of the summer, okay? Mm -hmm helping a referral so i thought oh well you know it's it's my great client's brother they're not going to screw me over oh no way i'm pregnant they would never do that i've worked so hard i've done all this stuff it does happen so here's the thing is you have to remember the beginning of the day you make zero dollars right so you need to feel that every that you are worth that buyer broker agreement look at it as a loyalty agreement and i, I say that just because we're not do you work for free? I don't, mm -hmm. and I will not. And if buyers are unwilling to sign a buyer broker agreement with me to take them shopping on my time, so you're, it's kind of like we're paid by performance, right? So we're gonna put in the hours, we're gonna put in the time, we're gonna, we're gonna keep working, and we don't get paid until 30, 45, 60, nine months later sometimes, right? But we're still paying for the gas, we're still making the phone calls, we're still researching the properties, we're still working. So we work first, then we get paid later. And you've got to look at it that way, what you are worth. So uh, I want you guys to look in the mirror. What am I worth? Am I worth working for free? No. So please make sure you, you are getting a buyer broker agreement. Um, I call it a loyalty agreement to my clients. I just make it very simple. It's part of the buyer document. So we've all, we know about the buyer advisory. We know about the agency disclosure. I just throw it right in. Hey, we're gonna go over some, some normal buyer documents. Here's the market addendum. This just talks about how the market can fluctuate and we have no control over it. Here's the agency disclosure. I'm Tina Garcia, I work for my home group. I'm an agent on your behalf. Go through that. Here is the buyer advisory. Here's all of the things that you should know when purchasing a home. I'm gonna give you a hard copy and I'm gonna need a copy. Then you're gonna need the, the buyer broker agreement. I have seen this save people's commissions. And I've seen people that didn't sign it, didn't get it signed, and they have lost that commission. And the first thing our brokers, any broker will ask you, if you come to them and say, mm -hmm. yep, if you come to them and say, hey, I, I, my client just bought this house, I showed him the house. Like, I, I've been showing, I've been working with them for six months. First thing they're gonna ask you is, did you get a buy broker agreement signed? So, Take it from somebody who has, who has definitely felt it, felt the pain. Um, I do still have the brother as a very good client, but the other buyer, I have never worked with again. But anyway, so solid, clean offer from pre-qualified buyer cash, no blanks, and, and I'll show you in my contract. So everywhere that there's a little blank, I rewrite, like if it says, you know, five days, I put five. 10 days, 10, unless I'm changing the terms. But I don't need blanks, not applicable. Um, just good advice that I've heard over the years from really, really great mentors of mine. All terms addressed, all pages completed and included. Does it take more time to write a more thorough offer? Yes. So here's what I advise, make templates. I have a template for investors, I have a template for aggressive cash offers, I have a template for FHA buyers, I have a template for VA buyers. Start making your templates. And then when you go to write that offer, you're like, boom, okay, 
I'm going to go with, um, you know, Melody. She's a conventional binder, putting 20% down. I'm going to use my 20% down or my conventional template, and then I'll put in the 20%. That'll help save you some time. But at least you know all the little pieces are, are taken care of, and all you have to enter is specific to the property in that file. So it saves you some time. So again, it's a lot of preparation, I feel like, but once you get your system in place, it's like anything, you know? It's like if, if you were gonna start uh, running a marathon, when you first start, you, it's bumpy. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna be able to do this. You know, you might not drink enough, you might eat too much, you might throw up the first day, but every day that you're out there, you get better and better and better. And your system starts to get sharper and sharper and sharper. And it becomes second nature, you know? I have lots of the contract memorized now, which is weird, but I think just doing it over and over again, you get to that point, right? Um, include and sign, so uh, all pages completed and included. I will tell you, I still today get offers where agency is missing. Uh, lead based paint is missing even though it's built in 1960. Um, the, one of the pages of the contract is missing, like step page four is missing. Um, they will put the wrong, so, so it's such a crazy market lead, they'll put the wrong address, but then the right APN number because they, they left the address from the last contract that they wrote. Make it very, here's the thing, on the, the listing agent side, here's what a listing agent wants to see. Simple, fast, easy to accept. They don't want to have to correct your work. They don't want to have to call back, say, hey, you're missing this page. Hey, can you get me this? Hey, we don't have initials on this page because it makes their job harder. So there's a lot of psychology of knowing where the listing agent's coming from too. Listing, people buy from people they or like, right? And they're going to be resistant to anybody that they don't like or anybody that makes their job harder. It's just natural. It's just a natural human thing, right? So again, go back to that psychology. Um, so signed and initialed. And just go through it. Start memorizing it. If you, here's the thing. What is, what is something that some of you guys do professionally or have done professionally other than real estate? Like, like you're, you would say you're better than average at it. It could be anything, dance, like music, like anything. Anything? Anything? I actually did presentation sales to uh, execs. Okay, presentation sales to execs, right? Mm -hmm. The first time you started doing it, were you good at it? Oh, God, no. No! I was stumbling and I was sweating for three yeah. and saying, like, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it, it, it takes the practice, right? So it's the same thing, same thing. So another thing I want to make sure is don't give up. Okay, that's what I'm telling you. Fail. I failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed, and then I started figuring it out. And it's like it's gonna click. It's like, ooh, okay, I got this. All right. Now my confidence is here. Now my experience is also here because I have several sales under my belt that I can reference, that I can look back on, I can learn from. I avoid those awful consequences. You know. Um, so fact find, uh, I always call the agent in advance, I too. always. I, I highly recommend it. Um, I know this is a competitive market. Again, yeah, you have to also know who you're dealing with and what market you're dealing with. So if you're dealing in a market where you're under 200,000, you may not have time to do this step. If this is kind of like if you have the time to do it, here's the ideal scenario, okay? But if you're under 200,000, and you're trying to find a first time home buyer, a big state buyer, a house, and there's one house that comes on the market every three weeks and it's gone in days and has 50 offers on it, you're not going to be able to fact find contacts. You're not going to be able to do that. But let's say you are looking for someone who is in a $300,000 price range and there's, you know, say a handful of homes for them to look at. Yes. And here's what I advise take them to the home, make sure that they like it. Obviously, they like it. Call from the house. You know what? Why don't you guys just go ahead and keep looking around the house, buyers? I'm just gonna go make a quick phone call to the, the listing agent and just see what's going on with the property. And then here's the thing. This is where you become, it's like, happy nice, but it's poker face. This is, this is the game starting now. So the second you get on that phone, you're giving up your poker chips, right? Okay, I don't play poker, I'm just referencing this stuff. I'm not good at it. I don't like poker. <laughs> but. Um, here's the thing is you are going to give away with your voice, your tone, what you share with them. So you want to be careful what you're sharing. And I always try to just gather as much information as possible. 
Information to me is leverage. You are looking for the leverage in every transaction. Hi, Mary. So we're over at your listing over on um, Hermosa Drive. Just wanted to find out if there's any offers on it. Not right now. Not right now. But I would love to see one. Okay, all right, gotcha. Well, we've got about three more homes to go take a look at. My clients are incredibly qualified. They, they're even past desktop approval at this point. Uh, they're conventional buyers, 20% down. Um, this is definitely something, it's definitely in their top two, but I will keep you posted. Just wanted to verify. Now, behind the scenes, my clients are jumping up and down. Like, we have to have this out. Oh my gosh, forget the rest of them. We don't want to go look at anything else. But how did I act on the phone with the client? I'm not letting them know that. Oh no. Okay, I'm keeping calm, cool, composure. I'm asking if there's any offers. You know, I might, if I notice something weird about the house, if I notice that there was like something, you know, roof or something, I notice there's a leak. Yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. You didn't call the agent before you went to go show the listing? Possibly, possibly. And I might have. Um, a lot of times I will. It depends on, again, who you're looking for, price range, how much is available. This one we were talking about, say, a, a, you know, a handful of properties to look at. So I may not have the time to go and call every single property in advance, but I'm definitely going to pull all of them and I'm going to have them all available. It, it really just comes down to who you're dealing with and the, and the, the price range that they're looking at. So if, say, in a 200000 I'm probably going to call every single one of them, but I'm probably calling them while I'm driving right. because i got to hurry up and right. get them there and call it because right. it's so fast. Because I'll come up on the market and they're under, they're under contract. And I have listings like that. I had um, property had over 20 offers on it recently. It's a madhouse. And when you are that listing agent, you don't want to talk to anybody because everybody's asking, everyone's begging you to get their offer accepted. So it's hard to filter through all those phone calls, you know, so a lot of times you'll see those MLS notes that say, please submit your offer to, da 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 you know, and you'll get voice messages. But yet you're right, yes, you do want to try to, again, there's a lot of steps you want to try to do. I'm sharing with you a couple different scenarios. So, uh, fact find, try to gather as much information. Is it a divorce sale? Is it, you're looking for leverage. So is it, um, why are they moving? You know, questions that you can ask. And we'll go through some more questions. Um, submit offer quickly. So I always recommend if my clients say, this is the one, or, oh my gosh, I, I think this is the one. I, you know, first thing I will tell my, my buyers is, you know, can you picture yourself living in this home? And would you regret if you didn't at least give it a chance and try to make an offer on this home? Because those two things are gonna tell me how much they like it, right? If they like it enough where they say, I don't want to look at anything else, or let's say it's the first home that they actually looked at and it, it met eight of the 10 check marks, we should write. So and I always, here's what I tell buyers to say, okay, Tom, I know that we're not done looking at all the properties that, that you wanted to do, but here's the thing, is the last four properties that we looked at last weekend are all under contract. So if this could be the one, we want to lock it up. And what do I mean? Make an offer, get it locked up so nobody else can take it, and then during that due diligence period, that 10 day inspection period, you're able to gauge and see whether or not it's really for them. That's when you let them sink in, drive the neighborhood, check all the um, schools, check the crime statistics, whatever they want to check out, you're going to let them check out during that, that time period. But the delay is what a lot of people will do. And here's another piece of advice I will tell you. Well, let's think back a little bit. Why did they have you be their buyer's agent in the first place? Hopefully because of your professionalism and your experience, right? They need somebody to help guide them. So here's what I see a lot of buyer's uh, agents do, is their buyer tells them what to do, and they start following what the buyer wants, and then they just keep going to house after house after house after house, instead of redirecting and making sure that they're the ones kind of in the, the you know, you want your buyer in the passenger seat, you're driving. Does that make sense? So it's not that you're telling them what to do, but you're gonna know, because this is what you do for a living, you know how fast the other homes are going. You, and I would even have that conversation in advance. So you're you're looking at, like I had a lead last night at midnight. Um, hey, 
looking for a house in ASU, first time home buyer, just want to buy something while I go to college. Okay, great. Are you already working with a lender? No, I'm not working with a lender yet. Um, I might have family that helps me out. Well, here's the thing. You're looking in a $235,000 price range, max, in Tempe, and it's a very competitive market. We need to first find out who's paying for it. If you, here's a link to a uh, preferred lender, let's get you pre-qualified, or let's talk to family. So here's the thing, again, shooting yourself in the foot if you're not getting them in a position to actually act, right? Right, so submit offer quickly. And when I mean quickly, I mean as quickly as you possibly can. Don't do this whole, well, we're gonna go to dinner, and then we're, we'll get, you know what, we're gonna sleep on it, we're gonna do it overnight. Sometimes they're gonna do that. And all I say is be respectful, but try to be professionally, give them professional advice on the risks of waiting, of delaying. So I will say, you know what, I get it, I get it. I know this is a very big decision, but here's the thing. And you go back to, I always reference other stories, other examples, so it's not me telling them. It's, I'm saying, hey, I was working with some buyers last weekend. They actually um, have said that, you know, they had wanted to wait on three houses that we looked at. They just didn't feel comfortable making an offer right away. All three of those houses ended up going under contract, and now we cannot find anything in that price range. And the interest rates went up since they first got pre-qualified. So reference things, again, it's like you paint the picture of if they make this decision, this is what's going to happen. If they make this decision, this is what's going to happen. So what if the home's been on the market for like 90 days and they say, oh, it's not going to go anywhere? That's a, good, that's a good question. And that will come up. So here's what I say is, you know what? Every home has a certain number of days. And it could just be that that particular home got listed at the wrong time. It could have been an accessibility issue. It could have been occupied. Then they moved out. But if this is the home, again, you've got if, if you feel like you could see yourself in this home, I wouldn't delay. If you want to uh, make up your mind during the first 10 days and you want to change your mind during those first 10 days, don't let somebody else come in here and get that off, get that uh, property from you. Once you have that offer accepted, it's yours. You control the situation. All I'm trying to do is get you into a controlling status with the property. That's your job. Your job is to get your buyer into a controlling status with that property. But once they are in a controlling status, they decide. Do I like the house? Is there too much work? Is it, How bad is the AC? How bad is the roof? Uh, how much is it gonna cost me? Did it appraise? You know, if the appraisal comes, they're gonna be able to make all those decisions. But if they never make the offer, they have no control. Then they move on and somebody else takes it. And that is what often happens. So I would just kind of, again, you, you paint the picture. Well, you could do that, you could wait, but what if? This is, these are things out of our control. We want to get you into a controlling state. Make sense? Okay. And then um, submitting offers quickly. So I am. I will call, say they don't answer, leave a message. You're going to have old school people like messages. You're going to have people that never listen to voicemail. You're going to have agents that only text. You're going to have agents that don't even have a phone. I don't know. It's weird stuff. Okay. <laughs> Smoke signals, whatever you have to do to make sure that they know you submitted an offer and you get a confirmation of receipt. I have literally had, so I've been licensed since 2006. I had a multiple offer situation, represented buyers, submitted my offer. The agent recognized me and knew me from a long time ago and was like, oh my God, Tina, it's so great to hear from you, blah, blah, blah. She's like, okay, awesome. Uh, send the offer over right away, blah, blah, blah. Um, it sounds great. I think my clients will like it. So I called her, we connected. I emailed her a confirmation receipt. I didn't get a confirmation. So an hour goes by, I'm like, she sounded like she wanted my offer, sounded like that, you know, that everything looked good. What's the deal? How come she hasn't confirmed receipt? Text her, hey, did you get my offer? She's like, oh, did you send the offer? Yes, I sent the You know, I'm like, yes, I sent the offer like an, an hour and a half ago. So I go back, look, yep, sent. Um, she, oh, that's right, she had, re sorry, she responded back to us with a multiple counter she sent it to my old email because it was saved in her computer. So I had kept calling, texting, emailing. So what I'm getting at is make sure you're constantly communicating because little things can go wrong. And she was like, oh yeah, I just didn't think you guys were gonna, um, you guys were going to um, answer to our multiple counter. 
No, we want it. She wants it. She wants the house. My correct email is, G you know, what email do you send it to? She's like, tinasensorialcox.net. No, haven't had cox.net in years. It's Gmail, Gmail. So right away, I was able to like swoosh in there, get it resolved. We ended up getting the offer accepted. So, and that was about six or seven offers. And that was in a very competitive price range. Um, Erica was like two or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, so request a confirmation of receipt. Uh, another, another reason why this is so important, documentation beats conversation. Write that down. If you've never heard that, write that down. I want to embed it in your brain. Documentation beats conversation. If you had to prove to your buyer who is depending on you to submit that offer and something weird went wrong, like an email or like a, a missed, you know, maybe you send it over to the wrong email, you send it to the wrong agent, maybe it's for the list agent, not the co-listing agent. If you get the request, if you get the confirmation of receipt, you can prove to your buyer, I sent it, they received it. And then communicate to your buyer, hey, I sent the offer, I called, I text, I emailed, haven't heard anything yet, but as soon as they confirm receipt, I will let you know. And then let your buyer know and keep communicating throughout the process. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. How about submitting an offer when there's a uh, list and a co-list? Uh huh. I always send it to both. I agree with you. I do always. Agree. And and look at the instructions on MLS. Mm -hmm. A lot. There is a lot. I feel like uh, bigger, bigger teams or bigger agents or um, see. I don't know. I, I feel like there's there's this thing going on where it's like, well, read it, but otherwise I'm unavailable kind of thing. <laughs> Like yes, it kind of blows yes, my mind yes. that they don't but answer yeah. the phone, they don't return the phone yeah, calls or anything. Yeah, so I our office is only open until five o'clock. We're yes. not open on the weekends. weekends. Yes. So yeah, that's why send it to everybody. Mm -hmm. Call, email, text, keep calling. Like I'll do every like hour till I get a, a, a confirmation. I'm not doing that the whole process, but I want to make sure if, if I am up against multiple offers, I want to make sure I know they got it. And then when I get them on the phone, I'm even recapping it. And I, I'm going back to fact finding. I'm going back to how credible my buyer is. I am building rapport. So building rapport to me is one, another huge strategy. That's with any kind of sales. It's the whole, you know, you buy from who you like, right? Um, Obviously being polite and respectful. You know, you don't want to call up a list agent you're trying to get your offer accepted and say, so, I, I sent you my offer, did you get it? <laughs> no, we want to be a little bit more, more um, polite and respectful. I know you are, and here's the thing, I do stuff like this. I know you are so busy. May I ask you a few questions before my client and I need to write the offer? Uh, you know what, I hate to take up your time, Jermaine. I, you, you seem like a, a very professional agent. It sounds like you've got a lot going on to play with this listing. But hey, I just have a couple questions to ask you. Doesn't that sound a lot nicer than if I just said, hey, do you have any offers? You know, and I feel like we get in this rush, this fast pace, where I'll get those calls. So people are like, um, I'll just get a text out of the blue. Want to show your listing tomorrow, 2 o'clock. And I'm like, which one? Like, can you tell me who you are? What listing are you calling? I have several. Are you even, do you know, do you know who I am? Are you calling the right agent? Mm -hmm. So right then I have to call them back. Hi, this is <laughs> Tina. What listing were you calling about? Which one, you know, so think about that. You want to, you definitely want to put, be, there's a huge level of respect you've got to give the other side, okay? Um, consider seller's interest first. So how can I give the sellers an offer they can't refuse? So you ask that agent that, Here's the thing, the agent wants to get the best deal for their client. So a lot of times they'll share with you, you know what, my clients, they they have to sell this whole house in order to buy. They're really going to need some kind of a, a lease back or they're going to need a, um, a loan close of escrow or they're going to need flexibility with the close of escrow. So all of these little things that they're telling you now become your leverage. And now you can go back to your buyer and say, hey, guess what, I found out these things. So I know you don't care about your close of escrow. Um, what if you offer them a 60 day closing? I know you could close in 30 days, but it sounds like they need that. And I try to give, I try to give leverage that isn't costing my clients money before I give them leverage that costs my money. So I don't, I know, I try not to go with the highest offer. I try to go with the best terms. Yeah. And I try to figure out what those terms are that the other party wants first. And that's why I'm calling and I'm, I'm asking. And they usually respect that. They're like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, well, please use our title company. Oh my gosh, it's like a big estate sale and it's so messy and weird and they've got all the, you know, you've got all the documents and title already. 
you know, listen to what they're telling you. Look at the notes on MLS. If they say, so when I'm writing in competitive markets, if they ask, you know, I know it's the buyer's choice uh, title company, but if they're asking to use security title, they're asking to use lawyer's title, they're asking to use fidelity title, just do it. Yeah. Does it, what's it going to cost your client? As long as it's a reputable title company, in my opinion, a, a heavily insured, well-known, reputable, not a small mom and pop, no name, um, I, I don't ever see a problem with it. I prefer my buyers to use a title company I know and trust, but I'm not gonna lose the house over it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's happening a lot more too, so. Um, try to have a good positive conversation prior to contract submission. I try to get them to remember me too. So I might, you know, say, I don't know, say they answered the phone like, hi mom, or you know, something funny happened, okay? I'm, I'm gonna keep bringing that little joke up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, you know, hey, remember me? Oh my gosh, yeah, it, it would, your clients actually spilled the coffee when we were there, blah, 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 or, or your, their, their dog is so cute. What kind of dog was that? Oh, a cockapoodle, da, 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 da. Be memorable, you know? Be memorable with what, who they are. You want them to remember you. So when they see your name come across with that offer, they're more receptive to it. And even subconsciously, they get more receptive to it. They, sometimes they don't even really remember you, but they're just like, like they had a pleasant conversation with you, you know? And I, I try to smile and when I'm talking on the phone. Smiling when you are talking comes through the phone. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. It sounds funny, but try it. If you, if you talked on the phone very angry and mad and you were frowning, it would not come across nice and happy if you're smiling and positive, right? So I try to be the happy, positive, let's think win-win. How can we get this done? Let's um, you know make this as smooth as possible, you know? Okay. People like smooth. People don't want hassles or, or projects or problems. So people buy and sell the people they like, agents included. Be likable. Don't be a jerk to another agent. It will haunt you. It sure will. Whether you think it will or not, it will haunt you. It will. Yes. I, have so, I have a situation that um, the we agent. We can't talk about situations. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the <laughs> agent um, wants like 165 for, or 170 for the listing. Mm -hmm. And I can see finding comps that, that backs it. Uh -huh. So we wrote 160. And she's saying that she wants more. How do you combat that? Like, it, I don't think it's going to appraise, and I don't see anything that's going to make it 170. So obviously, I can't give them what they want. And my buyers are kind of want to, I don't want to pay over um, 150. And and I feel like that's happening a lot more often. So here's what I do: is I have a very uh, candid conversation with my buyer. Okay, hey, look. Here's what the seller wants. They want 175, you said? 170. 170. I, obviously, all of these comps that we're pulling don't show anything over 160, 165. Here's what we could do. If it were to appraise for 170, do you think you, you would be comfortable taking it? Let's figure out your payment, okay? So I want to figure out the payment. Again, paint the picture if you make this, this decision, okay? Because it could appraise. And here's the scary part in our market. They are appraising. Yes. Nothing is reflecting, it should appraise, and I am having them appraise. And it is, it's a bit scary, it's crazy, but it is happening. So recognize the market and the change and know that it is a possibility when you're advising your buyers. So go back to the buyer. Buyer, if it could appraise at 170 and your payment was only X, would you still want to consider it? As long as it doesn't cost you any out-of-pocket money for the difference. See what their answer is. They say yes then say, okay, here's what I recommend. And you can make an offer for say 170, and I would ask the seller to pay for the appraisal in advance, and then if it, as long as it appraises, then the buyer will reimburse the seller for the cost of the appraisal. Because you're saying, it's like putting your money where your mouth is. Hey, we want to give you the price you want. Again, what's in it for me? They want 170. We want to give you what you want, but in all honesty, I cannot see anything that justifies 170. And another thing, ask the listing agent. I'm trying, look, I'm trying here. My buyer loves the home. I see that you guys have it listed for 170. We can't really see anything beyond 165. My, my buyer does not have any extra money to come in with a difference. Um, can you send me whatever comps or however you came to this 170 price? Ask them. Because then now you're putting a list agent in, put your money where your mouth is. Who came up with this price? 
Okay, how would you get to it? So I was, again, we go back, you're, you're communicating, communicating, figuring out. Let's say your buyer says, no, I want it for 165, okay? You might just have to settle and go, we need to move on. You could also, let's say you have a buyer that has the extra money. So I would just paint that picture. Okay, let's say, you know what, buyer? Let's say it appraised for 168. There's $2,000 difference, okay? If the seller would agree to come in with half, would you be willing to come in with the extra thousand dollars? Paint the picture. What can happen? You can only control what you can control, right? So you've got to look at all the other angles. That's where it's like you, it's like you kind of look so far ahead. It's like the chess game. Look so far ahead to see what things can fall into place, and then you've got to adjust for it. But I always paint the picture, and then here's the bottom line, it is your buyer. If they are looking at a house that's 170 and they can't afford it, you shouldn't have been looking at a house at 170, right? They can afford it, this wants to be kind of cheap, like that. But either way. And, and here's what I would do. So here's, in that situation, so if they're looking here, but they really want to get everything for here, okay, it becomes an education process. So I would literally pull up every single home in that little area, see that one square mile, and I would just be like, okay, look, hey, number 14, listed for 165, sold for 162. Number 15, listed for one set, uh, say 161, sold for 161. Nothing has sold. So then you, it's like, and I don't tell them nothing is sold, so here's the trick, okay? When you're educating them, say they're, they're stubborn. Does anybody know anyone stubborn? <laughs> I am stubborn. Okay, say you, you uh, have somebody that's really stubborn, right? It's, it's like uh, my big fat Greek wedding. You know, the Windex, oh you make it his God, idea. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Have you seen that movie? The movie. movie. Okay, you see the movie. See the movie, okay? The only way they can convince the stubborn dad in this movie is they make it his idea. This works great, by the way, kids and husbands. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if the husband's in here, okay? This works. You make it their idea, or, may, or I'm sure you can do it on wives too. I don't think my husband does this. All right, so, Give them all the facts, and then it's like a light bulb. Oh, wait a minute, nothing has sold for 170. Hmm. And then I just go, hey, did you see this, the uh, comps that I sent you? What do you think? Because when you start turning it back around and now you're asking them to tell you what they think after you've provided the facts, why would they still think that 170 is gonna work? And usually I see that with a bigger difference than your situation, usually it's like 10, 15,000. Mm -hmm. But the education is, is a huge strategy too. So let them figure it out. Don't if you tell them, they become more stubborn. They don't want to listen. And I'm just running through my head the fact that if you tell them that if it doesn't appraise at your 170, are your clients willing to take what it appraises for? Exactly, and I agree. And that's the conversation with the listing agent again too. Hey, and if you could get your, if you know your buyers have something to contribute towards that, they, you don't have to say how much, but you know, you've got it in your toolbox. Now you go to the listing agent, again, you're looking at their side of the story. So, you've told me that you really don't have any prompts to support 170, but your seller insists on 170. I get it. What is gonna happen if it doesn't appraise? What's your seller gonna do? And now, he has to explain what seller's gonna do. And a lot of times, um, you, don't, you know, I mean, you might hear nothing. He doesn't care. He's just waiting for a cash offer. He doesn't. He just wants somebody to come in and give him what he wants. He's not selling until he gets what he wants. But to me, if both sides are not willing to think win-win and compromise, move on. You're wasting too much time. So, and, and again, you just have to look at every, anything you can control. There's always gonna be too stubborn of people, in my opinion. Um, or the really unrealistic seller or the really unrealistic buyer. And you've got to decide personally, is it worth working with that property or that buyer even? Because sometimes it's not even worth working with those buyers that have very unrealistic expectations. You might show them 50 homes and they end up renting. That's that kind of buyer to me. It's like chasing butterflies, okay? Maybe when you're five, but when, you're, when you need to hit the pavement and make money, you don't want to chase them. Relate to list agent and seller, um, you know, here's the thing, if you know that it's, say you knew there's like a ton of people through the house, wow, you've gotta be exhausted. I'm sure your phone has been blowing up, Melody, right? 
By the way, you, you're empathizing with them. You're feeling their pain. I had a listing like that a month ago. Oh my gosh. I, I couldn't get people to stop calling me. They were calling me at like 4 a.m. I had offers coming in. They're begging me. They're knocking on my client's door to see the house. It was nuts. Are you dealing with that? So then they start, they're going to, here's the thing. If you can get people to start opening up and telling you their story, oh, it's magic. Magic. Because people like to, to give their advice. People like to give their opinions. People like to tell you about whatever pain or pressure or, or obstacles you're dealing with, right? So I get them, I try to get them to open up to me. I just want them to open up. The more they tell me, the more leverage I have to work with. Um, and I don't, I don't want you guys to feel like this is a sneaky thing. I feel like it's, um, it's like professional fact finding. You know, I gotta know who I'm dealing with. I have to know, is this gonna be a reasonable agent? Is this gonna be a reasonable seller? Um, are they gonna be fair? Are they gonna be competent? You know, maybe the list agent has like, no clue what spuds are, you know? I, you know, every once in a while you'll run across something where it's just, you're like, whoa, like, maybe this is not, you know, something I wanna get my buyers into. Um, so build up the worthiness and solidity of your buyers and their and or their flexibility with terms, repairs, appraisal, etc. So if you know your buyer could come in with the difference and they have told you it's okay to mention that, say that. Like I would tell the, the listing agent that, hey, you know what? And, and we'll talk about escalation classes. Um, my buyer, they want this house. They, they will give you your 170. If it doesn't appraise, they even have some money to come in with. I don't, and I always say, I never say how much. Do not say numbers. You say numbers, boom. No, don't say numbers. I say, they have some, but I'm not sure how much. But I know, I know they want this house. So that's pretty reassuring, right? Like it could be $2. <laughs> I didn't say how much. But I sound confident that my clients want this house so bad, they're going to find a way to get it. <coughs> so my confidence, when I'm relaying that through the phone or in person to the other agent, they feel it. And guess what they're going to do? When they go to present the offers, they're going to tell their sellers the same thing. Well, this agent, man, I know her buyers want this house. I, I can feel it. I know it. They even have money to come in with the difference. Well, how much money? Well, I, I don't know. She just said they have some. You know, they don't, they're just, it's like they're tuning into for the seller. Sorry, what's in it for me? You know, what's in it for me? So think that way. What is in it for them? How can you make them want your offer? Um, create curiosity. Uh, this is, I, I love this one. I think it's really fun, okay? And, and I just think sales is fun. So I, I guess I'm kind of, I don't know. But to me, curiosity. If you're creating, um, you know, like, for example, if I say, um, hey, you know, Robert, hey, Robert, I have got the most interesting buyer, and they're going to write an offer that it, it's an unbelievable offer. Can you give me a call? Okay, all of a sudden, I created this weird curiosity, and he's like, oh, incredible. What? Why didn't you just submit the offer? But it makes them think, right? Or, you know, I could say something else, like, uh, you know, but create some kind of sense of curiosity. You know, it could be like, uh, hey Danelle, um, it's so awesome to cross paths with you again. Um, give me a call. I got a buyer for your house. And Danelle's like, Tina, like Tina, 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 four days a week or something, but somehow magically make transactions happen. Um, I create the curiosity. You know what, I have got a, just a really, really, um, you know, I can't even talk about it. Uh, can you just give me a call? It's very important. Like, what's it gonna do? You're like, what the heck? Like, that's weird. Like, who is this girl, okay? And they'll call me and like, oh, hey, thanks for calling me, you know? Like, we don't even wanna talk about the weird thing, but I got them to call, okay? Sounds weird, but works magic. But you got it. Again, fail first, because it's gonna feel awkward first. You're gonna feel weird. Fail, and then you'll start getting, you know, better. Yeah, it's them that you're yeah. talking to and how to sell. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Yep. I would say to uh, speak clearly, have your information in front of you when you're gonna have that conversation too. Know your facts. Be ready for the phone call. So when I'm working with buyers, I have their, their information with me. I know how much you're qualified for, which lender, what their contract information is. I got all their details. 
I got which houses we looked at, scale of one to 10, what they, how they liked it, what they didn't like, what they do like, questions they had about the property. You want to sound competent too, because then the, the listing agent's going to go, man, that agent is sharp. I want to work with, with him. I want to work with her. I like working with agents that I feel are going to be equally professional and competent on the transaction. And they actually have a genuine care for it to go smooth and successful. I do. And I'll look for that. Um, so let's see. So let's move on. Any other questions? No? Okay. Alrighty. So clear and concise terms, of course, right? Keep it short and simple. Um, this is one. So $500 home warranty. It's funny. I feel like every buyer asks for a home warranty. I don't have a home warranty. I don't have a home warranty. You need to ask for a home warranty. Every buyer asks for a home warranty. Guess what? On that property for $170, if you offered, say, $168, but you had your buyer pay for their own home warranty instead of offering the $170, aren't they still on top? They're still on top, right? They're not giving them the full $170 but they're paying for a $500 home warranty. Or maybe they get a home warranty later. So this one, I feel like, right in this market, this is a simple thing to just make your offer stand out a little better because it gives the seller a $500 more net mm -hmm. or a $800 net, whatever you're asking for. But that can be a small little negotiating tool where you're like, hey, we didn't even off, we didn't even ask for a home warranty. My, my client's gonna pay for it. Or my client, uh, he, he declined it. You know, so you're, you're, again, you're going back to what's in it for me for the seller. So when you present it, that's a simple one. And I tell my clients, you know, hey, it, it might be $500 for a home warranty, but you know what? You could also do it on a monthly basis. So a lot of home warranty companies will let you pay per month, maybe a little bit more, but they could easily pay, say, 60, 70 bucks a month, and then get a home warranty also. But they've gotten a house for, say, $1,000 cheaper, $2,000 cheaper, $5,000 cheaper. So it's just a simple little Simple, simple, simple trick. So leverage your buyer's best terms. I am always selling my buyers to the listing agent. Sell them. Well, what are their strengths? You don't want to say, well, they're down payment assistance. They, they really don't have a lot of money. They've got a rental, but they've got, you know, I don't know. He, he's not sure he's going to keep his job. You know, he's got, his credit's okay. You know, who wants that? Nobody. So. I'm not telling you to hide their weaknesses, but definitely do not discuss them in the beginning. You want to sell their strengths. I have a local buyer. He lives in the same, he lives in Gilbert. You know what? He is so responsive. Every time the lenders ask for his documents, boom, boom, boom. He's got them over to him like within minutes. Man, he's such a pleasure to work with. How does that sound? The stage agent is relaying to the seller. This guy, he's got all his ducks in a row. He's a very solid buyer. Um, fully approved. So talk with your lenders too. If you have a, a, a great lender, they will actually put a great buyer through the process and they'll get them to like desktop underwriting. So now all of a sudden, and they'll even put, I ask them to put little notes in the prequel. Solid buyer, has blah, 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 whatever. Could even go up to da, 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 da. Or let's say you want to write an offer for X, but they could really qualify for here. Then you have a couple prequels. So you've got a prequel for this kind of offer, you got a prequel for that kind of offer, prequel for this kind of offer. But having the lender call, email, write notes in the prequel, it's helping your you sell the buyer to the seller. So um, the same situation. So the, the buyer qualified for like 180, um, and he wrote, or we wrote 162. Either way, uh -huh. we kind of little ball a little bit. Is it? Is it? Should we have? change the pre block because we couldn't afford this much. I would. Kind of. I would, because here's what a list, okay, think what the seller's doing, okay? When I get an offer, first thing I'm doing is, one, I'm checking to see if it's solid, it's, well, everything is, is um, included, everything is signed, initialed, and then I'm going to the pre block And I'm looking on that pre block to see if, and, I'll, and we'll go to, I have the pre block we'll pull it up. But I'm looking for lines 25 to 28, and I'm seeing if they say yes or not applicable. I want no no's. I'm looking to see how much you're qualified. Does it match what they offer? Ooh, they can actually qualify for more. Well, we're listed for 175. Why did they give us an offer for 162? Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't need seller concessions, but they asked for that. Okay, 
So here's the thing is talk with your lender before you write to so you can have a prequel that matches your offer. And, and I've had like five, six prequels sometimes when I have buyers who super qualify, but this is what they want, this is what they could get, this is what we do, you know? And then it just kind of depends. But yeah, definitely keep in communication. I would definitely change. I wouldn't have a prequel for like higher than 165 if you're offering 162. Like you don't have to have it exact, but definitely don't have it where it's a big gap because now they have leverage on you. It's like chess. Your turn, my turn. Yeah. Okay. Buyers flexible with close of escrow. Um, that is huge. Okay. To people that have to change schools, change work, deal with dogs, whatever, if there is a flexible close of escrow, a lot of sellers appreciate that. So if you're, if you're, uh, so uh, Danelle's working with a buyer. By the way, Danelle's on my team, so I know a lot of her stuff. But um, Danelle has a buyer who their lease doesn't expire until November. So they have a lot of time, right? And they just went and looked at a property where the buyers or the sellers wanted a lease back because they have to sell their home in order to buy. Make sense? So we talked about it and they could actually do a longer closing. He's a VA buyer, so they can't do a lease back. Uh, but, you know, we just talked it through with the lender to find out what's the best way that she could sell them. So she went to the seller and said, hey, we can't do a lease back because he's VA, but we could definitely do any close of escrow between now and November. Like, how does that sound to a seller? Like, that's all the pressure. Oh, my gosh, we don't have to just settle. We don't have to just buy whatever once our house closes. We actually have time. We have flexibility. That is a huge convenience for a seller who is in that sort of a position. Uh, buyer paying cash. Um, or buyer has cash for the difference if the appraisal comes in low. Okay? Those are our selling points. Buyer has funds coming low appraisal. Uh, there is always leverage on both sides. Always listen for it. And that's a big thing too. Listen. When you're on the phone with the other agent or if you get the opportunity to be in the house with the sellers, listen. Listen to what they say. Listen to what they're talking about. A lot of times they're just gabbing away like, oh, yeah, this has just been so crazy. We've my husband's already in Portland. I gotta deal with this mess. Da, da, da. They're, it's like they're throwing up all their problems right in front of you. All you have to do is just listen to them and you just start putting it in your toolbox. Other thing I will say with buyers, if you're going to visit even vacant homes now, because a lot of homes are, are having um, A V, so they're listening. Uh, do not talk openly in the house that you're looking at. I just don't. I tell my buyers, hey, let's just keep it quiet till we get to the car, we get to the next house about the last property, okay? We don't want them knowing your leverage, so just keep it quiet. Even, and I also tell them to hide their excitement. So you'll have buyers, you know, their kids are like, this is my room, mom, it has the, the master closet you want. You know, they're like, I, I will educate them in advance. Like, hey, we gotta just poker face, walk through the house, this is nice. Hmm. I tell them to do the whole, hmm. you know, here's the thing, hmm is undecided. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I love this house, honey. Uh, can we just write it off for now? What does that do? Oh my gosh. You lost all your leverage. <laughs> all your poker chips are on the table, okay? So you gotta bring them down, bring them down. And sometimes it's super hard, especially when you got a bunch of people you're showing. But try, try to get them to just, hmm, is this nice? considering mode, not super excited mode, and then obviously you don't want them to see something super mean or negative in front of a seller because sellers love their houses. They bought it, right? So you don't want to you don't want to hurt their feelings, right? They're the ones that put in the green countertops. Oh yeah, yeah, they're the ones who, who raised whoops who raised uh, you know three or four kids there and, and there's they put little check marks of all the heights and ages and stuff. Um, so another thing to do is make the list agent's job easier. Now, why would I say that? Why would you try to make the other agent's job easier? So they like your offer. They like you. They like you. They like your offer. You make their job easier, okay? So it's better than another agent. Be different, be creative, be unique. So I, I will even say, like, say their DocuSign's all messed up, their dot loop's not working, their computer crashed, they're in pace and camping. Hey, I have offered to say, hey, you know what? I'll just go ahead, um, you know, hey, 
your seller's going to accept this, awesome. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to send it out. Uh, if you want, I'll docu-sign it to your clients. Are you okay with that? I assure you I'm not going to communicate with them in, in any other way, but since your computer crashed or you're in Payson, let me just docu-sign it to them, and that way everybody gets a copy. I'll CC title, I'll CC the lender, I'll CC your transaction coordinator. If I'm in Payson and I have an agent who has said that to me, and I have no internet connection, I'm trying to enjoy my, my family camping trip, Yeah. I love you. Mm -hmm. I seriously love you. I'm like, that's an awesome agent. I want to work with Jermaine. How cool is that that they did that? I have even brought in a guy, a uh, six pack of Coors Light, because he said he had such an awful day and he had lost three clients. I was like, and he said, oh, if I could just have a, a six pack of Coors Light. Uh, hey, uh, I think his name was Mike. Mike, just thought I'd drop off a six pack of Coors Light. Hey, did you get that offer? It was weird, his office laughed, but guess what? We got that offer accepted. It was super weird. What did it cost me? Six bucks. Mm -hmm. And cold, tall, silver bullets. Mm -hmm. That's it. It was weird, but it got the offer accepted. And guess what? Every time that I, it was my, um, he was with three to five. Anyway, he every time. He tells all the agents to call. Like, call, call me, because they'll get right there. Stuff, <laughs> <it's really hard. laughs> yeah, no, he had a really, 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 really rough, rough run. I mean, he, we've all met those agents, you know, we've all had those horrible days, but he had a really, really rough day. So, you know, just something simple. Um, I've even said too, like, uh, I know you're super busy, blah, 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 you know, can I, can I just, you know what? How about we meet for lunch? I'll treat, okay? What's it gonna cost you? Maybe it cost you 10 bucks, 15 bucks, 20 bucks, but you get now you get in their face. Mm -hmm. And now they feel guilty because you bought them lunch. So they're gonna listen. They're gonna open up to you. Sounds weird, works. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, fill out all of the list agent's info on the last page of contract. This right here, please always do this. I hate that one. I will tell you, list agent's biggest pet peeve is when they have to fill in their own information on a contract they're about to accept with a buyer's agent. It's their job <laughs> to fill this out. If they're writing an offer, okay? And if you don't know how to do it, get help. Look it up on MLS, office member. You just look it up, all right, yeah, I just copy and paste, boom, 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 boom. But when you leave it all blank, it's like, it's like, ugh. You know, it gets frustrating. Yeah. Now when you're in zip forms, yeah. um, it'll leak. Like I've um, heard. Oh, yeah. it's so easy. I have the easy. home information, the legal description, the address. You that cannot is, mess it up. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. And I need to take that class. I have not done that yet. I have heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Me. So, I could. So you could mess it up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good if you're like a buyer's agent and you're writing 10 offers. Exactly. You'll just have to start a new one, but it will move quickly. Perfect. Because you're not going to mess up the address with the different, you know. Right, once you type in the address, yeah. it automatically pulls that you list click agents. on the bus and then it says, you know, on the last connect. And if there's a problem, you know, it's going to tell you. But it's easy. Once it's done, it's done. Perfect. So perfect. So use the zip forms connect when you are filling out your offer. I have not tried it yet. I did it on the first one and it was easy. Is I it? thought it was automatic. Just well, I, I still get offers where it's not built in, so they are not using it. I need to tell them to use it. Um, follow listing request instructions. Look on the docs tab. If there's something on the docs tab, it's meant to be for your buyers. It's something your buyers should know about. So if there's uh, features and amenities, if there is a lead based paint, HOA addendum. Um, if there's not, if there's not an HOA addendum and there's an HOA, do you just not include an HOA addendum? No, you fill it out. Just fill it out, and then I will show you some ways that you can disclose it. Um, to know what time is it? Um, quarter after three. Ooh, yeah. Okay. All right. We're, we need to move on. Okay. I'm gonna go a little bit quicker. I just want to show you some of these. So, buyer's ideal team. A buyer's gonna have their buyer's agent. They should have a lender that they trust. They're going to have, they should have their title company. And then I would always make sure before you're writing an offer, they have a home inspector picked out. Because here's the thing, once we go into acceptance, it goes fast, very fast. And the most important piece is gonna be these guys here. Everything else can come into effect if and when needed, right? But these guys, and then go the extra mile for your clients. Follow up, follow through, nonstop. Follow up, follow through. Make sure everybody, get your LSUs weekly. 
Uh, let's see here. So three buyer contingencies. So you guys aware of this? So anytime you are working with a buyer, there's going to be three contingencies where they can change your mind, where they can get out of having to complete the purchase, that or they truly can't complete the purchase. So they're going to have their inspection period, usually 10 days. They're going to have their appraisal done if they're a finance buyer. Usually that's done within the first 10 to 15 days. And then three days prior to close of escrow, they should have loan docs to title, right? So they have an inspection period, appraisal contingency, and a loan contingency. Know them and educate them with your buyers. So again, when you have buyers who are hesitant to write, I tell them, like, the seller has all the risk. Like, there should be no hesitation other than you don't like the property or you can't see yourself in the property. So you have the first 10 days, you get to decide based on your inspections. Then, if the long as the appraisal comes in, you're good, right? And that's a good thing. If it doesn't, you could change your mind. You'd be back out, get your earnest money. If your loan got denied, God forbid, you get out. There's, there's such little risk on a buyer's end, there's so much more risk on a seller's end, in my opinion. All the way up until closing date, the seller, to me, is much more at risk. Uh, be available, be reachable. So. You guys should have, I don't know why, but I get offers too where they don't have any contact information. It says, here's my offer, thanks, Sarah. And I'm like, I got an email on Sarah, but I have no way to call or text or find out who Sarah was and what brokerage she's with. So have an email banner. You know, um, I had this one created a long time ago. I think they changed the design of it, but it's on um, icrm.mobi. But you should have, you know, a way for them to reach you. You should have a cell number, you should have an email address. By the way, I did send that offer with my correct information, even though that other lady sent it to the wrong one, but she had it in her, yeah. So um, all emails should have at least that information. Your first call, see your name, phone number clearly, repeat your phone number. If they're hard of hearing, maybe there was a bad connection, you want them to be able to know how to reach you. And then um, my first text, again, so this was kind of like my creativeness. We had a couple questions before we do. Oh, bouncing. Oh, that's awesome. okay. So be available, be reachable. Once you initiate that conversation, save their number. I save it. I'm like, list agent, Hermosa Drive. Sarah Perkins, whatever it is. Like I'm, I'm writing it in, I'm saving it. So the second they call me back, I already know it's them. And guess what, how do I answer? Hi Sarah, great to hear from you. Thanks so much for calling me back. Rather than, this is Tina, how may I help you? Because then it's, it just sounds phony, right? I'm, she's like, whoa, whoa, how, how'd you know it was me? Yay, happy. Um, so, let's see here, be memorable. Make them laugh, remind them how you know each other, if you do know each other, empathize with them, offer to help them, compliment them. Um, research them, Facebook, find out who they are, find out the, the sellers, find out what they owe on tax records. Do your homework. The, and then uh, another book that I highly, highly recommend, this is, in my opinion, the best book I've ever read. How to Win Friends and Influence People. I love that book. Read it, and I, I literally probably read that one too every, every year. Love this book. It's very good, it's helpful in all situations. Uh, thank you for investing your, in yourself today. I'm gonna just show you quickly these contracts so you can kind of see. Uh, let's see here, so. Obviously you're gonna have a purchase contract, right? So I just wrote kind of a phony purchase contract just so that we can see. So you're gonna have buyer's name as it appears on the prequel or the proof of funds, okay? If they tell you their name is Jack or say Rob, but then on their prequel it says Robert or Roberto, you need to have it the same way as, the, as because otherwise you're just gonna have more work down the road. Lender's gonna go, nope, needs to be this. You gotta change it, okay? So name as it appears on the prequel or the proof of funds. Uh, name as it appears on tax records or advice on MLS for the seller. Let's say you're not, it doesn't really, say it's confusing, there's something confusing. You can always just check this box, and I always check it anyway, as identified in section 9C. So a lot of times it's hard to tell, especially with the inheritance, estate sale, bankruptcies, weird stuff, divorces, who the seller's name truly is. So you can just check that box and leave this blank if you want. Um, correct address, write it in. This whole connect sounds like it fixes a lot of these things, but I've had offers where they forget the APN number. Please make sure the APN number's on there. Um, legal description, I just copy and paste it from Monsoon, maybe that pops in there. Uh, purchase price, so let's say $280,000, $5,000 earnest money. If you want your offers to be accepted, write strong earnest money. What does it do to your buyers? If, if, I mean, here's the thing, if it's in their bank account sitting there, what's the difference with it sitting at title? 
As long as it's protected, there should be no problems, right? So um, a lot of people say, well, 1%. So rather than say, you know, if my clients have 2%, 3%, I've even done a, on a $280,000 purchase, I might do 10 or 15,000. Because perception-wise, it looks like a stronger offer. But it really doesn't net the seller any different, it's just perception, it's psychology again, okay? And it looks like you're really interested. And then I write, to be delivered to title within one business day of contract acceptance. So I'm telling them when it's gonna be delivered. That's another pet peeve for list agents, is trying to get the earnest money from the buyers. So if I'm saying this is per contract now, it's gonna be delivered to title. Go ahead, Jeremy. I was told on the buyer side you tried to offer less amount, but on the seller side you tried to get more earnest money. Getting your offer accepted strategy, you want higher. So you want as high as your clients can. So you don't want them going broke, you don't want them depleting their savings, but if they have $15,000 in savings, have them put $5,000, you know? I try for 2% at least. Yeah. So, and me, 5,000 is an easy number, so fine. Um, down payment, write it in. If they have a down payment to put down, write it in. If they can do a higher down payment, but they may decide they wanna do, so let's say they could put 20% down and their prequal reflects 20%, but they've been considering only putting 5% down because they want to save their money to remodel. I still write my offer with what the prequel will say and the higher amount because it doesn't matter. They can change, it's their loan terms that change, it's their down payment that changes. But on this piece of paper, it's aggressive and strong. So I write it the highest you can actually put down. And then I write in here what kind of loan it is and I, I like positive words, successful close of escrow. Okay, so I just, upon success, I'll do cash upon successful close of escrow. New VA loan upon successful close of escrow, etc. okay? Uh, earnest money, I just write certified funds now. There's a whole bunch of stuff with wire fraud, personal checks, people feel uncomfortable about. I have had a personal check bounce on an offer. Um, <clears throat> I've had a buyer write a bounce check on an offer. So I just write certified funds, and I tell my buyers, that's just how it is. That's just what we do. This is the policy, this is how it is, okay? Um, so let's see, so escrow company should always be checked with an escrow company. Let's see, so close of escrow date. I try to do as close to 30 days as possible. VA and FHA, I would say you, you really got to communicate with that lender, but you're probably looking at closer to 40, 45 days with VA, down payment assistance, anything USDA, all that stuff is gonna be longer. But if you can do 30 days or less, do it, it's aggressive. People want, unless they ask for a loan closing, then you're gonna do what they ask for. So possession, um, remember I said no blanks, so I write it in. So it says buyer at close of escrow, I check it, close of escrow. But am I writing this every time I write an offer? No, because I have my template. Um, addenda incorporated, so you're gonna put what's applicable. I always include agency and market on all my offers, but if it has an HOA, I'm gonna check the box HOA. If I chose to do additional clause addendum, I'm gonna check it. If I had a contingency, etc. Stay away from contingencies if you don't have to use them. If you don't need seller concessions and you're writing an aggressive offer, don't ask for them. Or, for instance, a lot of people get in the habit of just writing 3%, 3%, 3%. If your buyer only needs $2,000 or 1%, only ask for what they need. Sellers truly should not, in my opinion, they truly should not be paying for the other party's closing costs. So this whole, we got through this like era where it was expected, you know, 3%, we're gonna get them to pay a home warranty. We changed, it's evolved. Sellers know they don't have to. So if they see your offer and it says 3% and they look and your prequel says no seller concessions, they're gonna get offended. And the list agent, a good list agent is gonna point it out. So just keep that in mind, how they're gonna perceive your offer. So here, uh, refrigerator, sorry, this box should have been checked. So check this box, as seen on. So I write as seen on the date that we saw it and as shown in MLS, if there's a picture of it, to reference it. Some people will take a picture of the model and they do all this stuff. You could do that too, but this, to me, this is good enough. And then if there was washer and dryer, you do the same. As seen on, da da da. Um, you don't have to have the brand? Uh, some people do, but I feel like when you're showing so many, here, here's, yeah, I'm being really remember. honest, it gets so hard. Yeah. So if I have a client who goes, oh my gosh, I love this fridge, it's so awesome. Right away, I'm taking a picture, yeah. opening up, click, <laughs> and that way I just have it just in case. So then I can reference it. 
Um, but if they're just going to, did it have a refrigerator? Oh, well, MLS says it had a refrigerator. Well, we're going to just check refrigerator and we're going to write that. Um, so notice, again, no blanks. So type of financing, we said it was a conventional offer. We checked conventional seller concessions. If they don't need them, don't ask for them. And don't just leave this blank. Right? Not applicable because they're going to look there. So if it says not applicable, yay! They don't need them. If it's blank, they might still worry that you might need them. Does that make sense? Perception. Uh, let's see, appraisal cost, so uh, not applicable if, if it wasn't. Um, or you could put other um, split 50 50. You could put that it's paid by the buyer. So depends how you're writing. And I wrote this, this is my dummy for this class offer, but if normally I would check it's going to be paid for by the buyer, but what if I was um, having the seller pay for it in advance and then being reimbursed? So if you were doing something like that, you could put not applicable, um, or you could check seller if they're paying for it, but so it depends on what you're gonna do. This box here will, you, if you're asking for seller concessions, I always check that box will, because I want, them to be able to take it from the seller concessions if they can't reimburse the buyer for it. So buyer's choice of title should be the choice of title. Again, find out what your leverage is. If they're insisting that it has to be with XYZ title company, just put their title company. So, but traditionally it's buyer's choice. Um, and you can even put in additional terms. I've done this where I say, let's say they didn't specify, but I just want to let the seller decide. So I'll put seller's choice of title company in additional terms, and I'll leave that part blank. And then seller shall disclose name of title company within one day of contract acceptance, things like that. If I think it's gonna help. Uh, let's see here, so prorations have assessment, so again, no blanks, COE, I should rewrite it, but usually you're not gonna have any other close of escrow date. Uh, Lead-based paint, so I do check this box, lead-based paint information was provided prior to contract acceptance with my buyers. I just give them that pamphlet, it'd be a, uh, a digital copy. If you guys don't have it, you can download it from um, AAR, NAR has it. You can even probably Google a lead-based paint pamphlet. So inspection period, here's what I say, is normally it's 10 days. If you can, and if your buyer is willing and able, and you know the inspector can actually get out there within the first day, shorten it as much as you possibly can. They're going to want this, since this is the first of the three contingencies, right? They're going to want as short of an inspection period as possible. Now you could even go a step further, but again, there's, there's a huge liability and risk involved. You could write waived. You write waived, you need to paint the picture for your clients. You need to make sure your buyers know if they waive it, there's no going back, they can't, they can't get it back. So they waive the inspection, that first contingency is now gone. But I like meet in the middle, five days. Five days is less than 10. Five days gives my client enough time. And here's what I'll do is I'll actually call my home inspector uh, then or the home inspector they wanna use, whoever they're using. Hey, you know, home inspector, uh, we're about to write an offer on XYZ property, it's in Chandler, cross streets, da 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 da, will you be able to inspect this tomorrow? We wanna to do a five day inspection period. Uh, my home inspectors usually have um, same day reports, so as long as we get that report within the first 24 hours, we'll have four extra days to research, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to have that conversation with your buyer, but that's an area to be more aggressive and to sell it, and when I'm calling the agent, hey, they're only gonna do a five day inspection period. It's a positive, it's a plus, it's selling point. Um, so sewer system uh, checked, I always check it unless it's not, of course. Um, here, I just write in the five days, three days. So it defaults to three days, you can leave it at three days. I have been writing most of my contracts where I say five to seven days prior to close of escrow because I feel like sellers are getting sloppier. I left it at three for this example just because it says three and we're talking about write the same thing, don't leave it blank. But I've actually been writing five or seven here because I want time to say, oh, no, 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 no. It says it's fixed, but it's still leaking. All right, so it won't turn on, you know? And then we have time to get somebody out there. Because otherwise, you get delayed closing, all this other nonsense. Rates um, may not, um, may expire. So, home warranty, again, just simple trick. Decline it. Your buyer can always add it, but decline it. It's just a savings to the seller, and it's so tiny in comparison to 
the negotiation part, in my opinion. So it's a simple, buyer declines the purchase of a home warranty. It doesn't mean they cannot add a home warranty. It just means to the seller, it will not cost them money. Do you have any questions on that or we're good? So, um, so these are some other things that I just threw in here. This is not what I ran on every offer. Again, you've got to research, fact find, know your buyer, know the property you're writing on. But as is, you know, I know they got rid of the as is addendum for those of you guys that remember it. I copy all the verbiage from it and I'll add it right back in. So if I want to write an as is offer, write an as is. It doesn't mean you, you get rid of your contingencies. It just means that whatever comes up on the inspection, your buyer assumes risk, you know, the responsibility of or they cancel. So it's such a low risk in my opinion to say as is, unless you're dealing with a sketchy house. Like I do not recommend that on older, weird, right. funky, remodels, anything, anything that just gives you that spidey sense, like ah, I don't know about as is on this one. But if it's like 1985, newer, you know, it's, it's a established neighborhood, you know, seems like a responsible seller, you've got uh, like good disclosures, you know, seems, Sure, right as is. And here's the thing, here's what I'll tell you another secret. Every little step, you can also just renegotiate. So what if you wrote an as is offer, but then you started getting a funny feeling after you get the inspections, okay? So you get the inspection back, you're like, oh, I had no idea it was gonna be like this. Oh my gosh, you know, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong. So can you still ask for repairs if you write an as is offer? Yes. So it's creative, aggressive way to write an offer, but you can still change your mind. Here's the thing, is if they really want the property to be sold to your buyer, and there's a plumbing issue, or roof issue, or an AC issue that gets in the way, it's going to be an issue for any other buyer. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll go, hey, you know, they, they thought everything was working. I'm sorry, but, you know, I know we wrote an as-is offer, but, they don't have the money to buy a brand new air conditioning unit. This air conditioning unit has to work, you know? So unless your client's willing to buy a brand new home or a brand new air conditioning unit, then they're, they're going to walk. And again, you have that conversation with your buyer. What can you control? If we ask for them to replace the air conditioning unit and they say no, you would then have to pay for the air conditioning unit. Are you okay with that? So again, you're, you're communicating the consequences but it still ends up being the buyer's ultimate decision. So I'll always ask, and then if they say no, then we decide if we want to cancel or we want to deal with it. Make sense? But it still gives you an in. It gives you an in above other people because as is sounds scary to most agents, sounds scary to most buyers. But when you start explaining it to them and educating them, it's really not like, it doesn't have to be as is, is what I'm saying. I was the wrong contract better as is. Well, well, the seller warranty section changed. So the all in a, as is. Sort of, sort of though. If you read that section of the um, contract, it still says that it has to be in like the same, basically the same kind of condition as when you saw it. But who in here is an expert plumber? Who in here, which buyer are you working with that is going to go walk the roof before they write an offer? They're not. So the contract it bothers me in that sense. So you've got, to, again, you are hired to protect your clients. And if this is the way that you're going to get their offer accepted, but then you're going to come in and protect them, that's how you would do it. Well, the difference is before, they had to fix certain things. They, they don't have but to. But they still, but here's, here's the funny thing. It's arguable. They were supposed to have to, but you would have sellers that go, I am unable or I am unwilling. I don't want to. I don't care. That's why they took it out. Yeah, but you still the same thing. So even though that is in there now, I'll st we still ask for it, and I get it. Whoops. Hey, what happened? Okay. Um, I'll still have. Uh, we always will ask if it's something where my client says this is a deal breaker for me, or I just truly can't afford it. Okay, yeah. We're well, going to ask. The AC comes back on the inspection that it's going to need to be replaced and that's 5000 and the buyer doesn't have it and the seller won't fix it because it says well it's in now or it's February now yeah or March or whatever then then you might be at a standstill but my my selling point to that list agent is you're not going to be able to sell this house to any other buyer with a broken air conditioning unit you might as well fix it 
Let's keep this deal together. We have 15 days left. Paint the picture. You make this decision, you get this outcome. You make this decision, you get that outcome. I, maybe I just offered all my buyers and paid for the home warranty. And that's what that's... After. I don't know, you know, we broke offers in March, it was kicking in, and maybe it wasn't working, you know, I, I, I don't know. And, and here's, it goes back to the trial and error. It's like failing, it's seeing what works and what doesn't work. I am a big believer in you are worth every penny of your commission. You deserve a 3% commission on the listing side. It doesn't matter the price of a house, doesn't matter the age of the house, doesn't matter how hard one agent worked or the other, 3% and 3%. So when I see agents discounting their commissions, when I see them contributing towards a commission, it just, it hurts because I feel like they're just damaging themselves. And, and I know, here's the thing, it's a strategy. It's a strategy that I know several agents use. Uh, it's that whole flat fee, sell your home for $2,995. It's that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, we're in one of the highest tax brackets. We pay for everything up front, and there's no guarantee of our, so let's say buyer and seller get all the way past appraisal. We put all this work, all this time into it, they cancel. We don't get compensated. I have a deal about to, to go south right now, and we've been under contract for 60 days. Very qualified um, buyers, he's actually a partner at Snell and Wilmer, very, very qualified, but the deal could be going south. Guess what? There's just, there's no recourse. We, we can't take back that time. There's no commissions gonna be paid out to myself or to the um, listing, to the buyer's agent. You start over. Put the house back on the market, go back to work. You know what I mean? So I, I do not I do not think I have I have consistently sold for 12 and a half years real estate now. I am a hundred percent commission. I do not have any other jobs, any other income that rolls in. I just sell real estate. And I, and now I have a team that I, I work with and they also sell real estate within our team. But I consistently get 6% listing agreements and I consistently get 3% commissions and I probably less than 1% of the time ever contribute towards anything. It, that you gotta look at it like this, it is what it is. If your buyer doesn't wanna come up to 170 and they can, why should that cost me money? No. If your buyer wants to buy that house but they don't wanna cough up a $500 home warranty that gives them benefits for 12 months, why is that your problem? It gives me peace of mind because I don't okay. want to hear, hey, do you remember I bought you the home warranty? Hey, I'm going to give us a call. And, and that it, could be your just, closing gift. It could be your closing gift. That's my gift. closing gift. I, I, I keep... Time. I'm going to pay for it. So, some sellers don't like it to see it anymore. Sometimes they offer it. They have it in there. Great. I just, I just don't have to. I still hear it. Hey, this broke. Great. Yeah. All the home warranty. Um, I, but the, I, the home warranty doesn't really cover things off or you have to like well it it covers the most expensive thing now it's not going to cover every little thing you know, the it, it is peace of mind but i still think it's a buyer or seller responsibility and cost yeah. um what i do is i i don't here's the thing i feel like i feel like it becomes a habit once you create the bad habit you get it's like you can't break it so once you begin to discount, once you begin to give, you begin to contribute, you start doing it on more and more and more transactions. So when you first did it, you were probably like, huh, okay, well fine, I'll just do it. Then the next time around, it felt more comfortable. It feels more comfortable. You start doing it more and more often. Now you you may do it on all of them, right? I just thought I kind of just decided that I was gonna, it used to be you could ask the seller for whatever you wanted. Yeah. You know, but now, you know, for us, the bank or whoever was selling the house, the house like, they don't want to pay. But that's where I feel like you, you, like my value is one, my experience. I'm able to better serve my clients, better protect them if anything goes wrong. I'm able to negotiate better offers. So my value to my clients, the reason why I deserve the full 3% is because of that. So, so my value is not so I can kind of throw them a bone. That's not my value. And I feel like agents have to come in with a completely different philosophy. They have to believe their value. And they have to just, like, you have to look at it like it's not allowed. It's not allowed. And the more you can do that, it doesn't become a habit. I don't do that. And my clients love me. Like, I have repeat after repeat after repeat. I have never, ever had paid leads that are for myself. They're all referral-based. 
do clothing gifts? I do. And I, and I don't tell them about it. I make it a surprise. And I'll do a very individual. I mean, I've had closing gifts that are like six, seven, eight hundred bucks based on a sale, but it's my choice what I want to contribute, what I want to do for them. I have had where I do end up paying for the home warranty, but guess what? It's a surprise. It's not expected. I'm not using it as leverage. I'm not using it to get the deal done. And I think that's the biggest difference. You've just got to look at it. You, at, Every day, think in your mind, I wake up and I have made zero dollars until I take action, until I get a contract accepted, until it actually closes. So you just, have, please promise me, you'll just start to try to think differently. Think of it like you're not allowed. I want you, every time you're about to do it, I want you to look and think of me that I'm sitting here telling you, don't you dare. Don't do it. Just don't do it. It's not going to cost you a good client. A good client's going to be your client for life. You treat them well, you do your job, you're protecting them, you're writing the best offer you can, they're going to respect that and they're going to give you more business for it. I had a client, I just went to a signing, she says, I, you know, honestly, she goes, you have worked so hard on this, I, I really wish that you were taking 4% and the other agent was taking 2%. Like, she can't change it, but it's a super nice compliment. Like, that's how much she appreciated me. She, she didn't mind paying that commission, she wanted me to have more of it. But I do, I go the extra mile for all my clients and they'd appreciate that. And I feel like the extra mile is more valuable than any other discount or contribution that I can give them. I've saved many clients thousands of dollars. I have negotiated deals where, where they're well under whatever they were expecting. I have saved them um, horrible surprises on the Binzer, you know. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, how do you combat 2.5 um, commission? from the listings right there with buyers and they're offering 2.5. Um, Who knows this answer? I got a good answer on this one. Don't sell their house. No. <laughs> the buyer broker agreement. Yeah, but say the, the buyer doesn't want to come up with the other additional. Okay, buyer broker agreement says that you're, you should say 3% or as listed on MLS, right? Mm -hmm. So if yours says 3% and you're able to get your client say 2% in seller concessions, you can then state that those seller concessions are to include half a percent of your commission, which because you have that buyer broker agreement, it's now an owed expense for the buyer. Hmm. So really? Creative. Be yeah. creative. Which I There's always leverage. I have you done that? I have done it. I did that just this contract and they're like, well no, we don't want to give concessions. And if they don't want to give, I mean, obviously, if they don't want to, again, you're going to come to some points where it just won't work. Mm -hmm. People are not willing. But your buyer could do it, for sure. They could they so could no, contribute that. Mm -hmm. um, I have never had a uh, buyer contribute the difference. So that is one thing that I, I, um, I do stand behind. I don't like asking my buyers to pay me the difference. I won't. But if I can get it out of the seller concessions, I would. And I will. I do. Um, if it's a two and a half percent, I just look at it as, I don't even look at the commissions until we're already under contract. Like I don't sit there and scan them um, and I just get in the habit of, it's gotta be my best service to my client. The commissions will come. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that, they will come. Yeah. So how do you ask for concessions if you don't know what you're gonna get paid then? Well, ask for the seller concessions uh, in your offer. Do you but know you what I mean? you don't look at the commission before you? Oh. But here's the thing, so let's say that you, let's say, I don't, I truly don't. I just go, okay, oh, you know what, I've had some where it's like 1.75, and I didn't even notice it. I just wrote the best offer I could write. I wasn't concerned about my commission is what I'm saying. Okay. But if you happen to notice it, and you're trying to get reimbursed that difference, so you've been working with this, these buyers for six months, and every offer they've written is 3%, and now they want to offer uh, on a property that's 2%, then that's how you could do it. But yeah, no, I don't. I just try. I, I look at. I just look at it like I gotta just do my best for my clients, and then I feel like the universe returns the favor. Mm -hmm. it's just that's how I look at. So I mean, I guess it evens out. Exactly. It yeah. Evens out because you get four percenters. You let your clients know during the buyer broker agreement. They know that you know my my minimum is three percent. Yeah. And they're they're wanting to make an offer on a property that's two percent or yeah. one and a half percent. Yeah. And I'll remind them. You know, I just want you to be comfortable and to be aware, because I don't charge my clients. Yeah. I tell them, I just want you to remember, you know, the buyer broker agreement, even though it says it is 
I am going to not collect that. I'm going to help you buy this house. Let's yeah. get you into this house. Exactly. They love you for that. Exactly. You know, and they will burn exactly. I and that charge them. I agree. And I feel like the referrals from that are more. Yeah. Yes. They just come and they it keep does. coming. You'll make it up. You'll make and it up. they they, they will not. brag. They will tell their friends about you. Yeah. They will say to their family members, "You are the only one that yeah. they could work with." Um. So let's see, so wave inspections, escalation clause, and I'll give you an example of it. Uh, seller's choice of title company, seller's choice of close of escrow. You could even write that, okay? Think of how you can create the leverage. Um, add any specific terms requested by the seller, be accommodating to their seller's request, uh, waive appraisal contingency, you could waive it. Again, realize the risk and paint the picture. Uh, let's see here, so we've got, uh, so this is a big one to me. Please do not send an offer and expect four hours response time. You have to be respectful in the sense, I know it's a competitive market, but give a 24 hour notice. They either want your offer or they don't. And to make them put that pressure on them, there's a perception behind that that's just gonna upset them. They're gonna get offended, pressured, that they're just gonna feel uncomfortable because you, you gave them no time to, to actually go, go home from work, eat dinner, respond. So 24 hours, I feel like even in this market is okay. As long as you wrote a good, solid offer, it's okay. And I would just do the whole follow-up thing. Hey, did you get my offer? Did you get my offer? Great, okay. When do you think the seller's gonna be able to take a look at it? You know, communicate with that. But don't, don't do super short. And don't do super long. Long gives them more opportunity for more offers. Okay? Um, so again, all the information. Um, so obviously your Connect does it, but make sure it all is clear and in there. And then, so purchase contract, obviously you're gonna have So you can have purchase contract. Who uses an additional clause addendum? I want to point this out because I feel like this is a document that a lot of people don't use, but it can be very, very effective. Who in here has used this? Do you guys ever use it? Mm -hmm. I like it. I really do like it. I use it every once in a while, but here's the things that I like. So I like backup contract, contingent upon the cancellation of a prior contract. So if you've got a property that you love and you found out they already accepted something, this is a great option. Write an official backup contract where your backup contract goes right into first position as soon as the other contract falls out. There's no like, put it back on market, get a whole bunch more offers. So you, you secure your buyer's place better. Um, and you can read the verbiage. Uh, this is on zip forms. So the other one I like, non-refundable earnest. So if your clients are dead set on a property and they've been looking for months and every single thing gets getting, keeps getting beat out, I mean, obviously, you don't want a $20,000 earnest, you know, non-refundable. But if you give the sellers something where they know as long as they accept your offer, they're going to get free money, they love you. Even if it's 500 bucks, 1000 bucks. So I'll do non-refundable earnest money. becomes non-refundable. It's still protective. Buyer's earnest money shall be non-refundable unless buyer elects to cancel pursuant to the due diligence section of the contract. Contract is canceled pursuant to the risk of loss prevention. And you could even do non-refundable earnest without these additional protections. This is the most protective way to do non-refundable earnest. But you could even say $1,000 of buyer's earnest money to become non-refundable upon contract acceptance. What happens with that earnest money? It sits in title until the property closes or cancels. It doesn't go to them right away, but if you did cancel or not perform, they know they're getting it no matter what. So in other words, um, the backup, they still have to deliver earnest money? To, uh... No. Uh, no, backup, you don't deliver earnest money until okay. it goes into effect. Okay. But they would have to give you formal notice that they've canceled the other offer and now your offer is accepted. And then you would, you would go through all the same motions. So it's like day one, once that happens. And you ask them what like, position you're in, right? No, if they accept that backup offer, your first position, they can't have multiples. You're next in line. Oh, okay. So you secure your, so there's a lot of things where, and, it, and here's where I see this really effective. Let's say that, like to say that you're 170 price, okay? You're gonna have, uh, the, so another strategy that I do not like is buyers will go in and they'll offer 180. Like it's listed for 170, okay? You see comps for 165. Some buyer comes in and offers 180, and I always get these on my really like popular listings, okay? I'll get some guy comes in super high. Guess what they're expecting? 
It's not going to appraise. Exactly. Yeah. They're counting on it not appraising, but they think you're going to go, oh, 180, yay, this is the best offer ever. I'm going to accept this one. Some list agents will, and some sellers will go, I want 180. I, want, I was only expecting it 170, but if I can get 180, awesome. And then they, they hope and dream and feel like it's going to somehow magically appraise for 25,000 more. But usually it doesn't. So I will usually, with that kind of offer, I'm countering right away. All right, are you willing to waive? You know, are you, are you basically willing to waive the appraisal contingency? And are you willing to come in with the difference? Nope. Okay, next offer. Okay, so be careful with that. Don't do that. But backup contracts are great when you hear the agent that says, Oh, well, you know what? My, my client got an, in, an incredible offer. It was like $10,000 over, over list price. Or it was $15,000. It was significantly above list price. Write it back up. Are they finance buyer? Yes, they are. Write it back up. And just some, some agents, some listing agents say, ah, I'll keep it there. You're gonna be, I'm going to let you know. Just don't. If they don't send you, you send them. Then. You send just it. Just send them. If they yeah. sign it, then... They won't, they won't remember to call you. Yeah, they They're not, you. yeah, they may, it's rarer and rarer, but um, with our market so fast, homes that can go into contract quickly, they're just going to go whatever's top of mind. So keeping in communication with them, if they won't accept a backup contract, then yes, keep in communication with them. I would call every three days. Hey, just wanna see how it's going with your buyer. How's it going? Inspection go well? Are you guys passed pass the inspection yet? Uh, did they order the appraisal? You know, once they order the appraisal, the appraisal comes in, I let it go. But if you get them to accept that backup contract, you know they have a legal contractual obligation to put you in first position if something goes through. And you can always rescind that offer. If you find something in the meantime, you can rescind that backup. So it doesn't mean you're obligated to them, but they are obligated to you. So with the backup, do you still have to purchase and a backup or just this one? You do a whole purchase contract, but then you check the box, additional clause addendum, and then you include this additional clause okay. addendum and check that box. Well, what would happen is somebody will probably come in with a better offer as you're writing your offer. So your offer is already written and sent, yeah. and you're just going to hear back, well, you were second place. Great. I'm going to send you this. Because that's what you want. Know, well, if you, don't, third, if you don't have this what? signed, right? If you don't have that signed. Yeah, sometimes it's challenging because they don't even, the listing agent doesn't even want to send it to you. So right? to sign yeah, it. It's exactly. Like, Please sign that. But I'll tell you, here's the thing, is the listing agent's obligated. If you give them an offer that is a backup contract, they have to present it if on their listing agreement they checked. Exactly. So they do have an obligation, and I would call them out on it. All right, so let's see. Um, so the ones I checked are the ones that I use. Waiver of appraisal. So I may waive the appraisal. You know, if I, my clients are like, you know what, I don't care what it appraises for. It's in the right school district. My kids have to go here. We need a house, da, 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 da. Waive it. I'm okay coming with the difference. And let's say the comps, you know, obviously make an educated decision. If it's, say, $10,000, no more than $10,000, and your clients are comfortable with that, sure, waive it. I mean, it's their choice. If they want to do that, they can. If they're not going to move for five, ten years, it shouldn't make a difference. But make sure they know the consequences. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I don't use any of the other ones, but just realize that these are all, all these other ones are here. So let's see here. Um, agency disclosure, you guys are all aware of that, obviously. I didn't need to open this now. Vinzer. So here's the thing with the Vinzer. Um, you can also send this over, and I've done this. This, is, this has been another strategy I've used. So if I'm trying to get this hot property, hot area, I will send over the binzer accepting the premises. If my client, say I have a handyman, so she has a, a handyman buyer. He can do magic to homes. Like he's just super, super talented. He's got lots of resources. He doesn't need a contractor. He can probably inspect the home itself. I will say, okay, they got multiple offers. Here's a couple of our options, and we go through all the options. Here's one of the options. You could actually accept the premises. So you could just say, hey, I, I, don't, I don't even need an inspection. I accept the premises. Cash buyers, I've done this with several times, our offer gets accepted. Because now all of a sudden they're like, we don't even need to go through an inspection. We don't need to wait for a Vinzer. There's no appraisal. There's no loan contingency. All three contingencies out the door. Boom, gone. So how solid are you if you submit this? Can you submit it when saying if AC is 
working in proper condition, roofs okay? You could, and I've got some uh, I've got some clauses that I'll share with you. So the section where they took out from the seller warranties. I sometimes, sometimes, depends on the property. Aggressive offers is hard to do, but I'll pop them back into the, the original offer and additional terms. And I'm like, hey, has to be in working order. Heating, cooling, electrical, plumbing, blah, blah, blah. So if they accepted that contract and say, yes, all these things are working and functional, and I put premises accepted then, and if something is not working, then it's against the contract. Make sense? So that is a, a, a good protective barrier. Um, okay, so let's see here. You could also waive. Uh, buyer's waiver of inspection is here too. So if they were waiving the inspections, I'll send this along too. Waived, and I'll write waived on the inspection, I send it over. So I'll do premises accepted, waived. So it's just like super guaranteed. They want your home. Doesn't matter what's gonna come up. There's a risk though, so please know the risk. I'm not telling you to do it on everyone. By your advisory, you know, send it over though. A lot of times people wait until their offer is accepted and then you go back in this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Oh, well, well, here's this, now here's this, here's this, here's this. Send it right over. If they see you have a complete, everything is included, it's less paperwork for them to have to track or maintain. They're going to like that. I love when I get everything all at once. Um, MLS, so I'll, let's see, it's three, ooh, we're late, huh? Um, I'm just gonna show you, so all these things, could possibly be used in um, offers, okay? Letter from the heart. I'm gonna have to have like a two-part class here. Jeez, sorry. It's the first time I taught this class, but letter from the heart. Write a letter from the heart. Those are wonderful. They definitely um, help. So here's some just examples. Be yourself, be real, no phoniness. Don't be like, hey, you know, don't sound phony. No one likes phoniness. Make it personal to the property you're writing an offer on. Your house reminds me exactly of the house that I grew up in. It, I love how the, the flooring is natural bamboo or whatever, blah, 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 blah. When you start complimenting their home, you're making them fall in love with you, okay? Because they put all those things in their home. They love their home. And if you love their home or your buyers love their home, they're gonna love accepting your offer. And I've had offers accepted where we're significantly lower in price, but we get accepted because of this letter. Uh, be respectful of the sellers. Address their names accurately. If it's Mr. and Mi Mr. and Mr. or sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, uh, the third or whatever, address it properly. Address it the way that they have asked. Uh, describe who you are. Who are you? We're a family of five. I just had a brand new baby. Blah blah blah. You know, describe who you are without being um, fair housing, obviously. Okay, so do not. Don't say anything about your ethnicity or your religion, things like that. I would just stay away from those things. But if you, I know familio, I do think familio works, but I would just kind of keep it simple. Um, if your offer was accepted, how would that change your life? So if you, if you, if you guys, ex I know you have lots of choices. I'm sure you have several buyers to consider. If you accepted our offer, we would be five minutes from our son's school. We would be two minutes from work. My husband wouldn't have to travel so so far, da, 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 all these things. So, um, you guys can take a picture of this, sign it, date it, keep it short and sweet. And then here's my additional clauses. I always use the letter. It's really, it really good. I would say nine points out of 10 makes a difference. It, I agree. Can you guys see this okay? So these are just, so I use little um, like clauses over the years, I just keep in like a little cheat sheet. So for this class, I kind of put together ones that I would use for um, aggressive can you, offers. Can you send us a copy of that? Because it's really hard to read. Is it? Okay. Yeah, if you guys want to leave your card up here, okay. I can go ahead and do the um, 100%, 100%, yeah. And then fit with. Thank you. There we go. So sellers shall provide any extra paint. And so here's the thing. If, if something specific for my buyers, again, once a contract is, is accepted, everyone has to agree to the terms, right? So these are different things I've used. So I've had a client who goes, well, I, I, I don't mind painting the house, but oh my gosh, where am I going to find this purple? I really like the purple. Okay, fine. Add that. Sellers shall provide any extra paint or paint names and colors, extra tiles, da, 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 to be included in the sale for future touch-ups or repairs. If you're willing to do the sweat equity, just ask for a little assistance to be able to get it done. Okay, still win-win. Seller should provide any details. If you have weird stuff going, I had a weird one with a pending lawsuit on an HOA. Reference it in your offer. If there's weird stuff, 
get answers in your offer versus waiting for the inspection or waiting for disclosures because a lot of times it's too vague. Um, let me, the one I wanted you guys to see for sure is the escalation. Who in here has used an escalation clause? Do you know what that is? Okay, escalation clause is helpful. You're basically saying, I don't know why, sorry, it kind of went, but escalation clause. So in the event, uh, if in the event and during the course of negotiations prior to contract ratification, the seller receives an acceptable offer from a third party in which the net offer to the seller is higher than the offer contained in this contract, the purchaser will offer incremental increase of $500 over and above their existing offer. So up to, so in an escalation clause, you want to basically tell the seller how much you're willing to go above their highest offer received, up to X. And then here's what you also want to make sure. You want to make sure that you get proof. So you do want to make sure that they provide a bona fide offer and they show you proof that they actually had a higher offer. Yeah. So there's a second section in there too. So uh, is verifiable and the competing offer is true, valid, and a bona fide offer. So they can black out the seller's names and stuff, but they could show you a screenshot saying, hey, we got an offer for 4,000 above, so you said you are willing to go $500 over, so you need your offer needs to come in at X. Because agents will play games with that. And they will, and that's why you, you write, so in your escalation clause, make sure that you have how much you're willing to go above, 500,000, 5,000, whatever, how much your max is, so up to X, and then make sure you ask for the proof. Okay. And the proof is the purchase contract and their um, pre-call to you, or just the purchase contract? I would just do the purchase contract, yeah, and they can black out like the seller's names, but everything else, that's a bona fide offer. And because proof. if they put the whole offer and you see the uh, other buyer's agent, you can always call them and ask. Did True. you actually yeah. submit an offer, or was this some old offer for me? Yep. Yeah, I've done that, and they're yep. like, oh no, wow, we submitted that you know, two months ago. Yep, yep. yep. So, if you guys want any copies, um, I'm more than happy to um, share this information. If you yeah, guys please. have suggestions for this class, please let me know. This is my first time doing this class. I kind of just put everything in my little toolbox. You took it out of your bag? Yeah, my toolbox, yeah. I, I'm a contractor at heart. <laughs> no, it was, it was very, very helpful. Good, good. It was good. very helpful. Good. And also validation for, yeah, what kind of doing things Good, yeah, yeah. And are you guys having some success or are you guys just struggling? I think certain price ranges are just still struggling. It's, yeah, I think it depends on the price range. It's a struggle no matter what because there's so many people looking for them. But um, yeah, you've given me some really good tips for, Thank you. for that. Thank, Thank you. you. I owe you a pen too if you want. So we were handing out pens earlier. Oh, I think so. It's a stylus oh, and a clicker on the side. This way. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's tricky. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, so if you have a property that you're eyeing or an area you're eyeing, put it on your own search and do it on your, your buyer search. Your buyers might be working, they might be traveling, they might be vacationing, whatever, but have it alert you so you know every single time something new comes up in that market and then be fast. You gotta be, you yeah. just have to be fast, that's all. And thorough. Yes. How do you go? And get into the habit of checking the hot sheets. It's yes, I agree. Get into the habit of checking the Do you know the hot sheets on MLS? So right when you log into MLS on the on the first page, it says hot sheet. Just look for hot sheet. It's everything that's been listed in the past 24 hours. Yeah. You had a question though. How do you go after um, off market properties? Say you're working with a buyer and can't find it. Obviously, everyone's doing it, yep. but going after off market properties. So Zillow, if it's yeah. if it's like for sale by owner or no, if they, it's like not even okay, every, I've done this. I got my first uh, $800,000 listing this way. This works. Door knock, okay? Yeah. If your your clients want to live in this neighborhood, go door knocking. Have treats, I, I'm a big thing, I like treats, okay? Treats makes people, well, like open up to you. Just kind of like, ah, it's like a, you know, it's like yeah, icebreaker. Ice breaker. Exactly, icebreaker. So I'll show, so say it's January, I have fortune cookies with me. I'm door knocking, hey, happy new year's. Just wanted to uh, find out if anybody in your neighborhood is selling their home. I have buyers who are looking. They're pre-qualified. They're cash. Or da, 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 da. They're looking for this. And all of a sudden, you'll end up getting people go, you know, 
well, we, we just bought our house. We're never selling. But you know those neighbors? What did those neighbors, honey? Remember those neighbors are telling us? You know, all of a sudden, they're telling you the story. They're telling you who in the neighborhood might be selling. Go to them. Hey, heard you guys might be considering selling. I know this is weird, but I have the sweetest buyers. They are a family. They just relocated here from from Oregon and they are looking for this neighborhood. The CTA school here is phenomenal. They've heard so much about it. The wife is pregnant with their whatever child. Da, da, da. Sell, 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 sell. And if you come to their door and you have got a buyer for them, guess what? You've piqued their interest. They're gonna to wanna to know how much. They're gonna start asking you questions. If they invite you in for coffee, go have coffee, even yeah. if you don't drink it. If they invite you for cookies, have a cookie, mm -hmm. okay? I sat for two and a half hours, my first uh, $800,000 listing. I was hunting for a teardown, actually, okay? Came across a, a home in, this is July, I don't know why July, but anyway, July, high hills, higher than these, high hills, I'm door knocking, acre by acre, because these are big, giant neighborhoods, horse properties, okay? Hiking, hiking, hiking. I think I had, I don't know, I think I had little, like, notepads or something, anyway. I go to this house, okay? Um, you know, like a grandpa, you know, grandpa answers. Cute, cute older guy, you know, he's got his overalls on, looks like he's working in the garden, you know, he's got white hair, he's just, just sweet, he's like the perfect grandpa, you know. He opens the door, how can I help you? You know, and he's kind of like off standish. But anyway, I just said, hey, you know what, uh, I have a cash buyer. I know this is kind of weird, but I have not been able to find him a home in this neighborhood. He's really wanting to live in this neighborhood. He wants horse property, he wants it zoned agriculture, da 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 um, do you know anybody that would be interested in selling? So anyway, make a long story short, he invites me in for homemade lemonade. Yum, okay, I'm in, okay? And I'm not saying this, this can be dangerous, females, mm -hmm. it right. could be very dangerous. He seemed like a very nice sweet. I found out that they own their home, you know, they originally built it, it was like 26 years old. They raised all five of their children there. They planted a pecan, I heard the whole story. Pecan tree for each of their boys. Um, all their kids are grown and, and you know, and you know, they, are, they have been considering selling for a few years now, okay? So anyway, they go long story short, he tells me that they have several friends that are real estate agents. He can't believe that I'm out hiking in July in high heels and trying to find, he, he just couldn't believe, like he respected the hard work of me going out trying to find something that wasn't available and said, I have tried to sell my home over the years. I have not been pleased with the real estate agents I've worked with. I know a lot of them. Many of them are family, friends, or they go to my church, blah, blah, blah. He goes, but you know what? I want you to sell my house. And I got a listing out of it, 6% commission. And the crazy thing is I ended up selling it to a buyer who was a also a real estate agent, owner agent, bought it. He loved working with me. And now I, he doesn't even, he has his license, but he doesn't like selling or buying his own property. So every time he needs to buy or sell a property, he uses me. No, it's like a just hobby, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, and then they ended up, yeah, sort of, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, hard work. Do what everyone else is not willing to do, even if it's peak of summer. You don't have to worry about high hills. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Appreciate it. Nice Thank to you. meet you all.